Hi, everybody. This is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics. I'm here with my friend AJ. You've got a company called Soundfield Audio. I actually came in here. I've known you for a number of years now through the forums. Uh, I'd come into your room. I think it was two or three years ago. And yes. I interviewed you and then never posted it, which was terrible um, because you actually have some really good sounding speakers. I'm going to guess probably none of my audience has actually heard of your products, Smooth. but you are somebody who, you know, people know me as being awful nerdy when it comes to acoustics. You challenge me. And have been a really good person to have as a friend to help understand. So do you want us to talk a little bit about Soundfield Audio, what it is you do as a company, and we can then talk a little bit about the speaker sitting next to you here. Right. So, you know, we're standing here at a high-end audio show. Um, you know, most people are aware of that sort of thing, you know, expensive equipment, that sort of uh, market. Um, but most of it is not really science trip. Uh, unless you're talking about marketing and you know uh, perceptual science or, or you know just just how things are perceived by people by the looks and the price etc um i got into the the speaker game because i wanted to produce speakers based entirely on science and perceptual science and of course i'm acutely aware that looks and price are a big uh, factor in how people perceive things so i i don't you know i don't um, deny or, 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 or try to uh, downplay that. That that is part of my uh, my you know appeal to folks as well. However, um, I do speaker design strictly based on measurements. Um, I, I rarely ever listen to them uh, uh, on, until, of course, I'm at a show. I will bring a speaker that I've never listened to because I'm comfortable with the fact that uh, I, I'm looking at the measurements in a way that I know how it's going to sound. And that might sound kind of ridiculous the opposite of what you would hear in, in high and audio where you, you have to listen. Uh, the measurements don't matter. I, I'm the complete opposite. The measurements matter and the, the, the listening will follow if the measurements are comprehensive and understood by the person looking at it. So, and you, of course you listen to the products you build though. And uh, ultimately I do, ultimately I do. But, uh, Again, if you speak to a lot of the quote unquote high end uh, speaker designers, they'll tell you, you know, they'll, they'll tweak a part, they'll tweak a this, they'll do. I don't. Uh, I, like I said, I, I, I listen only after I've, you know, completed all the measurements, maybe even wait till I brought it to the show. And I know that sounds dangerous, but I'm comfortable enough after building speakers for 45 years and measuring for, you know, 25 or so that I have a good enough grasp off the measurements and looking at the measurements, uh, much like your doctor would look at a MRI, uh, he's saying, seeing the same picture as you are, but he's interpreting it differently because he's, he knows what to look for yeah. and he's looked at brain deck for exactly, exactly. So, so anyway, I, I have a pair of speakers here that kind of reflect, uh, that sort of scientific approach. Um, kind of. <laughs> Well, it's control directed. You can tell already, you know, it's a horn, so it's it's control directivity. It has smooth on and off axis uh, right out of the book. Well, and it's a line array. I mean, it, it is a line array. That, that that's that's something a little bit different. And and kind of the point of these is I can build just about any type of speaker. Um, I have a gentleman coming down uh, from uh, Montana to to hear him because he wanted to hear a line array. He was infatuated with it, with other uh, line array through <laughs> audio, et cetera. So he wanted to hear what I could do with a line array. And so I, I built these on Tuesday this week, <laughs> as in three days. Uh, but the point is, is that uh, again, I'm comfortable enough with what I'm doing with the measurements to know that it's going to sound at least okay, far enough back with a line array, it, it'll sound good. Yeah. You have to be in the a far field. Right. So the other approach that I take is, um, you know, most speakers are going to go into domestic spaces. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to turn that into a studio or something that looks like an isolation ward at the, you know, the mental hospital. So I, you will see almost no treatment in my rooms. Um, that right there is mainly because if you're sitting very, you know, right against the back wall, it's not a bad idea to have some absorption, for the very early reflections. Uh, but otherwise that's just to stop the air conditioning from rattling from over there. Uh, the vent rattles like crazy. There's no treatment whatsoever. I firmly believe that the loudspeaker should treat the room and not the room be treated for the loudspeaker's inadequacies. So make the loudspeaker act, uh, adequate and you should not, should not 
have to treat or excessively treat your wound. You may have to add a treatment here or there, but you should start here first and not end up just randomly buying a speaker and then having to treat the room because of the inadequacies of the speaker design itself. Yeah. And I know I actually have a, a similar general view, but you don't believe in the idea of absorbing the first reflection. That's correct. The sidewall. That is correct. That really stemmed from bad speaker design in the first place. And that is also correct. That, you know, again, the 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 the, the AES uh, double blind studies by Tool, et cetera, um, there were there were people other than Tool, by the way. People always say, Oh, that's the tool school. That's not the tool school. It, it, um the um, Archimedes project uh, in Europe was going at the same time the tool was doing his NRC stuff, and they found the exact same thing, that people preferred that the off-axis reflections be sort of a, 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 a carbon copy or a blueprint of the direct sound because the ear is better at just rejecting that as, as just, it, it, it's, you're in a room, there, there, there's, there's reflections, and so I, 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 we've evolved as human beings for millennia inside spaces, enclosed spaces. And we instantly recognize it, that that's just the room. And we, for a large part, ignore it unless the reflection is so colored by having, you know, a, a poor uh, replica of the on axis that you start to notice it. You start to notice that, the, the, oh, that, that is a reflection. Uh, with a, a smooth off axis speaker, you don't. And so that's the point of having a controlled directivity, at least in the forward facing direction. Yeah. So, um, the other point, of course, is um, it also, you, people say, well, you know, control directivity, does it sound better? I, I've heard speakers that, that don't have it and it sound great. That's not what they found in studies. What they found was, is if you take a control directivity speaker and a non-control directivity speaker, and you put them in five rooms, you, you go to different rooms, different types of acoustic spaces, the control directivity speaker is going to average out as better. It, it's going to be preferred overall because the uncontrolled directivity speaker may sound good in one room wow that sounds great but then you move to the next room wow it sounds terrible the, the consistency of a controlled directivity speaker is what the appeal is is that you put it in this room or the next room it's going to sound more similar than dissimilar sure. and i think uh floyd tool said something along those lines that he said if you, if you take a steinway piano and you put it in this room which is not a concert hall you're going to instantly recognize it as a, a steinway if you hear your, your spouse talking, you're going to instantly recognize it's them. You can reject mostly the room unless it's like a, an echo chamber. Uh, you can largely ignore all the crazy reflections that a microphone's going to pick up and go, wow, there's reflection. Your brain just goes, nope, that's your, your wife. That's, that's a Steinway. It instantly recognizes, uh, especially if you're familiar with the sound. Sure, sure. Now, I think one of the unique things about your speakers, and I'm assuming because there are woofers firing on the sides of the right. Them, yes. <laughs> so most of your speakers are not controlled directivity just by a waveguide. You use other techniques to rest in the bandwidth of your controlled directivity, correct? Correct. Right. So these are actually cardioid in the bass. Uh, it's a damp U-frame. So there's there's woofers all the way up and down the side. There's actually 24 12-inch subwoofs in the speaker. There's six uh, 12 inch subs on each side, but the back is open and it's damp. So the damping creates a bit of a delay uh, and a reduction in output in the sound. And what that creates is uh, a, a, a null behind the speaker. Most people are familiar with dipoles, nulls on the side, but the cardioid is a little bit different in that the null is behind the speaker. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of ideal for sticking a speaker in, in a corner like I'm doing over there. Uh, that speaker stuck right up in that corner and you won't hear the bass booming and you won't hear it pull to that side. If, 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 a, if a typical box speaker is placed like that one, the, the bass image will shift to the right because it, it's, it's loading the corner differently than it's loading this. Well, well these are rating almost nothing backwards. Yeah. So you can, you can pull a completely asymmetric uh, uh, placement like that. And the, the base imaging will still maintain. Uh, well, and you've brought up an important point. So most of the people watching us may not fully understand, but most speakers doesn't have to have woofers all around it. The base is omnidirectional, right? It's all around. So when you stick them somewhere near a wall or in a corner, worse yet, you get boundary loading off of that, builds up a lot of base. Same reason why if you sit in the back of a room right up against right. the wall, often the base is a bit too much. In your case, your speakers don't do that. So the other side benefit of that is you have significantly reduced SBIR effect. So there's not going to be those Correct. face reading backwards, coming forward, interfering with that. 
Correct. Signal at the speaker and making peaks in depth. So the response is smoother, typically, I would assume, in the room with your speakers as well. Yes. Yes. They'll measure. Uh, so <laughs> going back to EAS, there were, there were papers done uh, several years ago on, on cardioid speakers placed in rooms versus uh, uh, monopoles and bipoles. And they found that the cardioid was the most immune to, to room placement. Um, uh, I forgot the name of the guy. You, uh, I'll have to look it up. But anyway. Uh, they, they found that, of course, that the cardioid can be placed just about anywhere in the room and still have good response. Uh, like every speaker, you know, you do have to, to play around with the placement a little bit, but the cardioid was just more immune to placement. And yeah. Uh, what they also found is that, of course, because a cardioid, like a dipole, excites less of all the room modes full intensity, a monopole will, in, at any one point, will excite all modes maximally for that point for the same point a cardioid will maximally uh uh excite some modes going forward but not other modes the side modes tangential you know bleak all that so the overall effect is that there's less modal excitement with a cardioid and if you look at the, the decay of the room in time now the decay of a cardioid is lower that's the actual benefit is that it decays uh, faster. And so perceptually, what that means is that you have a bit more clarity in the base, and then you can also detect spatial information to lower frequencies than you can with a, a, a monopole. And that's other people, again, AES papers uh, that have found the same thing, that a cardioid will, will uh, be more able for you to test spatial effects and stuff in the base, which common misconception on forums and online is that 80 hertz you can't hear any uh you know directionality below 80 hertz which is correct you cannot localize below 80 hertz but you can still perceive differences uh interorally in in inter interorally uh between left and right channel uh below 80 hertz about down to about 40 that's about the the limit of where you can hear uh, it, it, it's kind of a narrowing and widening of the base. That's the sensation. And, and it's not every room. Yeah, and I wrote a paper on this yes. that I think threw some people because the paper's end conclusion was depending on what you're doing and what you're using, right. that may not be a good idea. The other approach that some people refer to as multi -so, approach, yes. the multi approach, yeah. the multi -so approach may be better. And people took it as an indictment of that, but it's not what I intended or said. What I had said was that with the right content, it's clearly an audible effect. Right. It changes the perception of base, and there's good reason from these studies mm -hmm. and the science of how we hear to understand that that is in fact more accurate and right. the way it should be. Right. The problem we've got is we have an industry built on the notion of mono base, right. where they have summed everything to mono, and it makes it hard yes. sometimes to really hear. Them. All, all of what I'm speaking of in terms of the base quality and, and the spatiality, et cetera, it, it, it goes completely out of the window if you listen to mainly pop. And rock and that sort of thing because the bass is effectively mono and and home theater i mean movies that sort of thing yeah so what i am referring to is is music uh specifically stereo music and if it's recorded with differences in, in the left and right channel then you will be able to hear the, the spatial effect but if it's pop music uh you know movies and that sort of thing there is no effect to hear so I think mean, it's something right, right. So it, it, and it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, that was a choice that the industry has made yes. for whatever reason. And it's, it's sort of a, but so, I mean, I think people can reach out to me. They can reach out to you more so you than me actually on this topic, but there is music that's available this way. There. Well, absolutely. Yes. Classical music, jazz. There's quite a few genres that, that, that do not have mono, monophonic bass. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, that you're going to hear a lot of that kind of music here at this kind of show, actually. Well, in Atmos Music, I actually could see changing this. So it depends a lot on how they use it. But Atmos Music is technically discrete, full bandwidth channels. Right. They can operate all the way down to DC if they want to. There's no rule against that. And so you could start to see them mixing low-frequency content into those channels in wave. Now, the way it's often done, I think, is more of a parlor trick. But the way it can be done would be to actually recreate the spatial environment of whatever it is they're trying to immerse you in. Right. It could be an actual listening environment of some kind where this would actually be quite important. Right. And then having speakers, in fact, I think there's some research that was done in Japan on the importance of the directivity of the speakers for spatial sound. Yeah. Four, four channels was the bare minimum. You have to have 
two channels behind you. And well, for complete envelope. And very wide dispersion, if I recall, was not a good thing. It increased cross dock and caused some problems. So they were finding that having more control directivity a little bit narrower, not like 33. Right, right. That, that, it, it depends. It, it depends on the program material. Um, if you look at, I think there is largely my mentor, James Johnson. Uh, his, his, his speakers tend to be very wide directivity in the street, but he uses three channels. So that's three front channels, which is critical, of course. Uh, and he gets unbelievable, uh, type imaging and, you know, he's, it, it's called, uh, perceptual sound field, uh, re- re- reconstruction. So he literally reconstructs the sound field of a, of a live place. And people who have heard it have just been complete, uh, blown away by how good it sounds. And that's just five channels. Now he, he records in seven channels and he down, I gotta be careful with my wording here, down mixes to, to, to five, but it, it, it gives you, you know, just a sensation that you're actually in a real, a real space. Um, unfortunately I am hamstrung by the fact that 99.9% of music is stereo. I am fully, you know, cognizant of that. And so everything I do is based on these speakers are going to be fed a stereo signal. They could certainly be fed a home theater or, you know, whatever, a discrete so somebody multi-channel. 11 yeah. of these in the room. Uh, yes, they could. Yes, they could. Yes, they could sound probably still. Yes, they could. However, uh, one of the, the, the biggest, again, misconceptions that I see on forums, people say, well, even a stereo recording, um, the, the, the reflections are baked into the recording. And so if you have reflections in the room, it's a coloration. And that is completely incorrect. So your good friend, uh, Dr. Geddes, he said, no, the ear can easily, human ear can easily distinguish between a recorded reflection and an actual room reflection. Yeah. Uh, your microphone can't, but your, your human hearing, your binaural human hearing can easily distinguish between a real reflection in the room and one in the recording. And it's very simple. The ones that are in the recording come from one and two spots. That's it. The real reflections that are in the room are coming from all around you, or should be. I mean, so people are aware of this as a 2D versus 3D type thing. I mean, when you're getting it from the speakers, they're coming from the wrong location from where they would have come when they were recorded. Correct. Correct. So even in a multi-channel system, even in a, in a Atmos where you have the heights and you have you know, a whole bunch of speakers, they're still coming from points in space. They're, they're not coming from all around you in, in reflection. They're coming from mostly direct radiator, direct radiator, planar wave uh, type speakers that are positioned around you. So that is great for movie effects. It's perfect. It, 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 we've all heard it. You know, good Atmos uh, system. You're like, wow, fun and exciting. Yeah. But for two channel music, that's completely wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so. Going back to James Johnson, he said, I, the ideal speaker should have indirect radiation capability because the indirect radiation will give you that type of reflection from all around the room if it's properly treated, uh, processed as in delayed, diffuse, and possibly decorrelated, then your hearing system is going to perceive it as I'm in a larger space. Yeah, I'm in an actual space where there is real diffusion where there can't be in a, in a room this size. Sure. Well, this is a really interesting conversation. We have shut your room down for quite a while. Ah, so, yeah, yeah. I'd like to uh, call this video to an end. We'll, we'll do one little short one after this, but thank you so much. I think that you speak the language that I want my audience to understand better. Um, I said that people know that I, I sell acoustic treatment design work, but I do that with a different attitude towards it that is more science focused. Yes. And I don't believe, for instance, in deadening a room completely because I think it ruins the room. And, and actually for, for multi-channel and home theater and that stuff, you actually are better off with treatment because the, 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 the way that type of system is supposed to be played back is from multiple speaks, multiple points. Yes. And so excess reflections there don't help. So yeah, I'm not saying don't treat your room. I'm saying for what you're or doing. stereo, be beware of, of treating for most channel. Yeah, Hopefully. and for surround sound, I will say like I think you can over treat a room and oh, absolutely. ruin the immersive effect too. But anyway, we're gonna get this video uh, uh, going. So thanks again, and everybody, thanks for watching this video. And uh, hopefully, we can get AJ on to do some more of this because we could talk for hours and hours about all sorts of different. Well, hopefully, we didn't bore you to death here. But uh, no, I think it's cool. Thank you. Thank you all.